Today we recognize the legacy of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment with the ceremony hosted by the Undersecretary of the Army, the Honorable Gabe Camarillo. Please stand for the arrival of the official party. Now we'll have the posting of the colors. Please remain in, standing for the singing of the national anthem by First Sergeant Sammy Lewis from Fort Sam's own Army Band. And remain standing for the invocation to be delivered by Chaplain Colonel Monica Lawson. I invite you to pray in your faith tradition as I pray in mine. Let us pray. Eternal and all-wise God, we thank you for your presence this morning in this sacred space as we honor the legacy of the soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment. We take time today, O oh God, to shine light on a very dark time in our nation's history. We take time today, O oh God, to reflect, to recognize, and remember the lives that were impacted by this tragedy. We take time today, O oh God, to call their names and remember the cost of their service, a service that was not in vain. For, dear God, every name that is called is not only etched into this history, but is also etched onto the hearts of those who knew them and loved them. We ask, O oh God, that for every name that is called, we remember to tell the story of their life and of their legacy of men who were called to serve our nation and our community. For every name that is called, O oh God, we ask that you would continue to grant healing, peace, and restoration to their descendants, this community, and generations yet to come. We pray, dear God, that we would never again face such a miscarriage of justice in our ranks or in our nation. Our hope today, O oh God, is that when we tell the story of this regiment, we will not only be reminded of this tragedy, 
but we will also honor the lives and legacy of those who serve. It is in your most holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Brigadier General Ronald D. Sullivan, and it is my privilege to serve as your Master of Ceremony, especially for this event, recognizing the soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment. The year was 1917. The United States had just entered the First World War, and Houston, Texas was governed by racist Jim Crow laws. The 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry, an all-black Buffalo Soldier Regiment, was assigned to guard the construction site that would become Camp Logan. The soldiers came to town with patriotism in their hearts, ready to serve their country faithfully, but were met with racist provocations and physical violence. On August 23, 1917, these tensions boiled over. The soldiers of the 3rd of the 24th clashed with civilians and police in Houston, leaving 19 dead. In the aftermath, 110 men of the 3rd of the 24th were convicted after a mass court-martial in the process that was recognized at the time as unfair. 19 men were summarily executed without appellate review. Even with the backdrop of entrenched state-sanctioned racial segregation, there was an immediate public outcry about the miscarriage of justice. This led to a major overhaul in the military justice system, including establishing due process for service members and a board of review that would later become the Army Court of Criminal Appeals. That seemed to be the end of the story. Most people had moved on. Over the years, the Houston incident had become a historical footnote for niche academics. But the story was very much alive for the descendants of the wrongfully executed and the wrongfully convicted, as well as for a community of judge advocates, scholars, and supporters who came together to petition the Army for the right to right this wrong. It took years of hard work, patience, and hope to bring us to this point, and here we are finally. As an Army officer and judge advocate, I am humbled to be with you today. I am also tremendously proud to currently serve as the chief judge of the same Army Court of Criminal Appeals created in the wake of this Houston incident. Our court serves to ensure that what happened in Houston in 1917 will never be repeated. We are honored to be joined today by our distinguished guest. Here to speak with us today are our host, the Honorable Gabe Camarillo, Undersecretary for the Army, Representative Al Green, Congressman for the 9th District of Texas, and the Honorable Matthew Quinn, Undersecretary for Memorial Affairs for the Department of Veterans Affairs. We're also joined by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee from the 18th Congressional District of Texas. Members of the Texas House, Sean Theory, District of Texas, 146, and J.C. Jetton, District 26. Houston City Council Member Abby Kamen, District C, and other representatives from federal, state, and local levels of government. From the Army, we welcome the Honorable Carrie Ritchie, General Counsel for the Army, General Retired Vincent Brooks. Other general officers, members of the Senior Service, Executive Service, Sergeants Major, and other leaders. Professor Angela Holder, the great niece of Corporal Jesse Moore, Mr. Jason Holt, the great nephew of Private First Class Thomas C. Hawkins, Mr. Charles Anderson, great nephew of Sergeant William Nesbitt, 
who is tuning in with us via live stream. He is represented in this room by his nephew and Sergeant Nebert's great-great cousin, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Anthony Thompson. We'd also like to recognize Ms. Sandra Heitman, the great-granddaughter of police officer Ira Rainey, who was killed in the Houston incident. Ms. Heitman has been a steadfast advocate for the descendants in their pursuit of justice. Please give them all a round of applause. We would now like to acknowledge a group of people who have spent years passionately advocating for this cause and who have served as an invaluable resource to the descendants and to the Army. Professor Jeff Korn, whose research in the Houston incident was pivotal to supporting the Army's review. Mr. John Hyman, lead historian for the Justice Project that sought to overturn the convictions of the soldiers from the 3rd to the 24th and Lieutenant Colonel Retired Drew Brennerbeck, pro bono lead counsel for the Houston Incident Clemency Petition, whose passion for this cause is unmatched. This group had supporters who are represented here today as well, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as the NAACP, the South Texas College of Law, a contingent of retired general officers and flag officers, the National Panhellenic Council, and so many more. And of course, look at this, this venue. There's no more fitting place than the National Buffalo Soldiers Museum as a place to gather today. We thank Captain Retired Paul Matthews, the founder of this museum, and Desmond Bertrand Pitts, its CEO. Today, we remember the soldiers of the 3rd to the 25th. May we remember them revere them, honor them today and every day for their service and dedication to our nation. They were Sergeant William C. Nesbitt, Corporal Charles W. Baltimore, Corporal Larnon J. Brown, Corporal Earl Clowers, Corporal John Getter, Corporal Robert B. Jones, Corporal James Ball Moore, Corporal James H. Mitchell, Corporal Robert Tillman, Corporal Quiller Walker, Corporal John Washington, Corporal James Wheatley, Private First Class Howard E. Bennett, Private First Class William D. Boone. Private First Class William Brackenridge. Private First Class William Burnett. Private First Class John H. Goad. Private First Class Thomas C. Hawkins. Private First Class John H. Hudson, Jr. Private First Class James R. Johnson. Private First Class Ben McDaniel. Private First Class Alvin Pugh. Private First Class Stuart W. Phillips. Private First Class Carlos Snodgrass. Private Ernest E. Adams. Private John Adams. Private Wash Adams. Private Grant Anderson. Private Fred Avery. Private Charlie Banks. Private Tom Bass. Private Douglas T. Bolden. Private Fred Brown. Private Richard Brown. Private Robert Brownfield. Private Walter. Private Walter Burkett. Private Ali C. Butler. Private Harrison Capers. Private Ben Cecil. Private Henry Cheneau. Private James Coker. Private Babe Collier. 
Ivet Abner Davis. Ivet Ira B. Davis. Ivet Isaac A. Deo. Ivet James Divens. Ivet Gerald Dixon. Ivet William L. Dugan. Ivet Oliver Fletcher. Ivet James Gaffney. Ivet Callie Glenn. Ivet Henry Green. Ivet Charles J. Hatton. Ivet James R. Hawkins. Ivet Glenn L. Hendrick. Ivet Walter T. Johnson. Ivet George Hobbs. Ivet Norman V. Holland. Ivet William J. Hugh. Ivet Albert T. Hunter. Ivet John Jackson. Ivet Frank Johnson. Ivet William S. Kane. Ivet John Lanier. Ivet Richard Lewis. Ivet Do- Doyle Lindsay. Ivet Warshaw Lindsay. Ivet Douglas Limpkins. Ivet William Manns. Ivet Eddie Maxwell. Ivet Joe McAfee. Ivet Thomas McDonald. Ivet Ed McKinney. Ivet Louis O'Neill. Ivet Dean New. Ivet George H. Parham. Ivet Leroy Pinkett. Ivet Edward Porter. Ivet Will Porter. Ivet Harry Richardson. Ivet Luther Rucker. Ivet Roy Tyler. Ivet Thomas Jackson. Ivet Pat McWhorter. Ivet Samuel O. Riddle. Ivet James Robinson. Ivet John Smith. Ivet Joseph Smith. Ivet Robert Smith. Ivet Jesse Sullivan. Ivet Joseph T. Tatums. Ivet Eugene B. Taylor. Ivet Henry Thomas. Ivet Walter B. Tucker. Ivet Hezekiah Turner. Ivet Sherman Vell Telsir. Ivet Henry T. Walls. Ivet Joseph Wardlow. Ivet Grant Wells. Ivet Joseph Williams, Jr. Ivet David Wilson. Ivet Ernest Wilson. Ivet James V. Warford. Ivet James K. Woodruff. Ivet Albert D. Wright. Ivet Risley W. Young. Reuben W. Baxter, Bugler. William Frazier, Cook. Nathan Humphreys, Jr., Cook. Please take a moment of silence with us, and it will be followed by the singing of Amazing Grace by Staff Sergeant Kayla Winslow from Fort Sam's own Army Band.
Thank you, Staff Sergeant Winslow. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct honor to introduce our host for today, the 35th Undersecretary of the Army, the Honorable Gabe Camarillo. In this role, he serves as the Army's Chief Operating Officer and Chief Management Officer, helping to oversee a budget of more than $170 billion and shaping responsibility for the manning, training, and equipment of more than 970,000 soldiers across active guard and the reserve components. Mr. Camarillo's prior career includes significant experience in law, government, national security, and private industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Gabe Camarillo. Good morning. It really is a special honor to be here with all of you today. I want to first begin by thanking the City of Houston, Undersecretary Matt Quinn, my friend, Congressman Al Green, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, the Buffalo Soldier National Museum for hosting and participating in this truly special occasion. On behalf of the United States Army, I want to first also welcome the family members and the descendants of the soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment, NAACP leaders, students, and faculty of the South Texas College of Law, petitioners, state representatives Jetton and Theory, Houston City Council member Kamen, and so many others who have kept alive the stories of 324 soldiers and the injustices that they have suffered. Now, as Undersecretary of the Army, I have the distinct privilege of helping to lead the greatest land force the world has ever known. And one of the things that truly makes the Army so great is that we are a learning institution. Whether it's how we organize, how we fight, or how we take care of our people. The Army has worked very hard throughout its history to acknowledge mistakes and to correct them to become a better institution. It's that ongoing process of learning and of growth that brings us here today. Now, most of you already know the story of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment. Part of the Buffalo Soldiers, the 24th was formed in 1866 in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Soldiers of the 24th served on the battlefields in Cuba, in Mexico, and in the Philippines, and with their own hands helped to build the American West. Even as they faced discrimination from their own country, they fought very hard to protect it. The regiment's 3rd Battalion was assigned to Camp Logan at a time when racial tensions were on the rise nationwide. And on the night of August 23rd, 1917, those tensions exploded in Houston. Racially motivated incidents, rumors, threats, spurred a group of more than 100 black soldiers to seize weapons and leave camp thinking that they were marching in their own self-defense. And in the hours that followed, blood was shed. Innocent lives were lost. And months later, represented by only a single officer who was not even yet an attorney, the accused soldiers of 324 stood trial. After 29 days in session, it took a court only two days of deliberation to deliver the first of 58 convictions. And less than 24 hours after a short internal review of the verdicts concluded, 13 soldiers were hanged. It was the largest mass execution of American soldiers ever carried out by the Army. And by September of 1918, 52 additional convictions and six more executions would follow. Even then, 
the army recognized the grave injustices that it had perpetrated on its own soldiers. Immediately following those 13 executions, the army implemented a regulatory change that required then the War Department and presidential review of any subsequent court-martial death sentences. The violence and the aftermath also laid the foundation for a trial, post-trial, and appellate review process that today is a core part of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. As a direct result of the events of 1917, generations of American soldiers of all races and of all backgrounds have enjoyed more equal protections under the law. But the soldiers of 324 did not benefit from those protections. And so the Army has undertaken a process to restore their honor. Now, as a Texas native myself, I was grateful to participate in that process early in my tenure in this job. In February of last year, at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery in San Antonio, we unveiled the interpretive grave marker at the gravesite of 17 of the deceased soldiers. And at the time, we announced a review of the 110 court martial convictions. That marker has helped to tell this vitally important story and to keep alive the promise of honor restored. Today, we're here to deliver on that promise. And today, we formally announce three concrete steps to restore the honor taken from the soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry, all those years ago. First, the Army hereby sets aside all 110 court-martial convictions of 324 soldiers stemming from the events of August 23rd, 1917. And second, we direct the correction of military records to show honorable discharge for the 95 soldiers of 324 not restored to duty. Third, third and finally, in partnership with the VA, we've established a mechanism to deliver survivor benefits to families long denied the financial resources owed to them. Thank you. Thank you. It gives me tremendous pleasure to mark this occasion, especially in a room full of people who have hung on so tightly to these memories for so many years some of whom it's been a lifelong journey, as we discussed earlier this morning. For the descendants, two of you, who you'll hear from shortly, the soldiers of 324 are not just a list of names, nor are they characters in a movie. Mr. Jason Holt, he remembers his great uncle, Private First Class T.C. Hawkins, as a great man who was proud to serve, and he wore the uniform of a soldier even though he was seen in the eyes of so many as a second-class citizen. Professor Angela Holder was only six years old when she first saw an old photo of her great-uncle, Corporal Jesse Moore, on a family bookshelf and started to ask the tough questions that got us to where we are here today. During her journey, even as those hard questions began turning up challenging answers, I know that Professor Holder and her entire extended family have continued her uncle's legacy of service to this country. They have never faltered in their pursuit of justice and fairness. And through it all, they've maintained an unbound optimism in the goodness of their fellow man. Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Thompson is here as well, representing his uncle, Charles Anderson who I met, by the way, on FaceTime earlier today. 
Both of them are proud descendants of Sergeant William Nesbitt, who alongside T.C. Hawkins and Jesse Moore were among the first 13 soldiers of the 24th to be executed. And just note, I said Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Thompson. The spirit of service and public service in that family continues to this day. And as the families of the 324 soldiers sit here in the audience, I can only imagine the mixture of pride in their relative service and pain in how they were treated. Ms. Sandra Heitman is also in the audience today and is no doubt feeling that same blend of emotions. Her great-grandfather, Ira Rainey, was a Houston police officer who was killed on that horrible night in August 1917. And I know that Ms. Heitman, who has worked in law enforcement herself throughout her career, has held fast to his memory while still strongly supporting the Army's decision to restore honor to the soldiers of 324. Mr. Holt, Professor Holder, Lieutenant Colonel Thompson, and Ms. Heitman, you and so many others now join a distinguished list of courageous fighters who have pushed the Army to be better since its inception. In a final letter after receiving his death sentence, Private T.C. Hawkins wrote to his mother and father that, quote, by the time this letter reached them, he would be beyond the veil of sorrow, in heaven with the angels, end quote. Sadly, we cannot ease the sorrow that Private Hawkins and his family felt. As much as we want to, we cannot revise this difficult chapter in our past. But we can learn its lessons. We can use them to create a more just future for all Americans, including those who have bravely chosen to wear the Army uniform. To the descendants of the 324, I hope you find some solace in knowing that the Army has chosen to formally honor your relatives and that their legacies will live on. I know the memory of the 324 soldiers will stay with me personally. It will inspire me, and it will continue the hard work of making our Army a better institution. Thank you again to our hosts and to all who have joined us for this special occasion. Thank you, Mr. Camarillo. Our next speaker is well aware of what it means to memorialize those who have passed on before us. The Honorable Matthew Quinn is the seventh Undersecretary for Memorial Affairs for the Department of Veterans Affairs. He leads 155 Veterans Affairs National Cemeteries and 122 grant-funded state and tribal veterans cemeteries in providing a dignified burial in national shrines for veterans and eligible family members. He is a retired Major General, having served nearly 37 years in the Army and the Army National Guard. Ladies and gentlemen, the Undersecretary of Memorial Affairs, Ms. the Honorable Matthew Quinn. Well, good morning, and uh, to those who are here, service members, both past and present, to our elected representatives, and certainly, most importantly, to our family members, it's a great, great day to be here in Houston. I'm privileged to join you all as the Army works through uh, this process. General Sullivan, thank you for that introduction. Under Secretary Camarillo, my friend. I'm truly honored to participate in this ceremony, especially in this setting, at the historic Buffalo Soldiers National Museum. And thank you, sir, for reiterating the Army values. As someone who wore the Army uniform for nearly 37 years, I lived by the Army values throughout my military career, and I continue to live by those values. I am a soldier for life. Looking through the lens of the Army values, upgrading these discharges is the best choice, really the only choice for today's Army. I am proud to be an Army veteran, 
even more so today. Secretary Wormuth deserves great credit for thoroughly reviewing the available evidence in this matter and for doing everything possible to right the wrong of the past for these veterans. While we cannot go back in time to change the past from today on, we have an obligation to correct the record. Not only should we recognize the dedicated service of these Buffalo soldiers, we must restore and preserve their legacies in perpetuity. And that is the role of the VA's National Cemetery Administration. We at NCA honor veterans with final resting places in national shrines and with lasting tributes that commemorate their service and sacrifice to our nation. Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery near San Antonio is the final resting place for 17 of the executed Buffalo soldiers we are honoring today. They have been interred there for more than a century, but their historical headstones make no mention of their Army service. As was the practice at the time, the information inscribed on their headstones was minimal due to their convictions. Now, with the Army setting aside these convictions and upgrading the discharges, NCA is ready to correctly acknowledge and memorialize their service to our nation and, if desired, to provide new headstones with the same amount of information that every veteran is entitled to. Our Army, our Army has made this right, and we at NCA will make this right for future generations. As Undersecretary for Memorial Affairs, I will do everything in my power to make sure that each of these veterans has a proper grave marker at his final resting place. This is certainly possible for the 17 who are resting at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. Army is working with the families, and together we will carry out the wishes of the next of kin for their veterans' place of honor. For the soldiers who are not interred in a national cemetery, the VA will do whatever we can to pro properly memorialize them and to preserve their legacies. We will work tirelessly to accomplish this. While we cannot go back and change the past 106 years from today on, we can provide a platform to allow their descendants, their supporters, anyone here today and all Americans to post tributes and mementos for the current generation and future generations to honor the service and sacrifice of these soldiers. Let me say again, these soldiers who served their country. Our Veterans Legacy Memorial, or VLM, is NCA's online platform to recognize and preserve the legacies of veterans. Personal memorial pages are going live today for the 17 Buffalo soldiers who are interred at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. <laughs> By using VLM, family members, veterans, current soldiers, and any other supporter can now post tributes and mementos to recognize the service of these veterans to help restore and preserve their legacies. When you have a chance, please go to va.gov backslash remember, va.gov backslash remember, and look up the VLM pages of any of the 17 of these veterans resting at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. Post a brief tribute, even something as simple as thank you for your service, soldier. Any gesture like this helps keep their legacies alive. Furthermore, those of us who know their story have an obligation to tell their story. We owe it to them to discuss their service to our country, no matter how painful it is to recollect, recollect how their legacies were nearly hidden and ignored. We should tell their story so we can ensure this dark period of our history is not forgotten, to make sure they and their service are not forgotten. This is why we are here today and why VLM was created. As a nation, we must not forget the past, just as we must never forget those who have served and sacrificed for our country. Saying their names and telling their stories will help make sure future generations know of their service to our country. 
Again, Under Secretary Camarillo, thank you for inviting me to this ceremony. I assure you, sir, that the National Cemetery Administration will do whatever possible to recognize and preserve the legacies of these veterans in perpetuity. May God bless the soldiers we are here to honor today, their families, all veterans, and all service women and men currently serving our great country, and may God continue to bless our United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Our next speaker is the Honorable Al Green, representative for the 9th District of Texas. Congressman Green is in his 10th term as U.S. House in the House of Representatives. Representing the 9th Congressional District of Texas, he is a member of the House Committee on Homeland Security and serves as the chair of the Financial Services Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Throughout his 18-year career in Congress, he has been known for his unwavering advocacy for those in the streets of life, the less fortunate, the marginalized, and those whose voices too often go unheard. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Al Green. about you, friends, but it really meant something to me to see a Brigadier General of African ancestry standing here today in charge of this program. It meant something to me. And I'm going to fight back the tears to give this message. But General, Brigadier General, you stand on a lot of shoulders, but you stood tall today. Thank you again for your service. Thank you. I cannot but tell you that when the Undersecretary Amarillo made his announcement about the honorable discharges being restored or granted, and that the descendants would get benefits. I don't know about you, but I had tears to well in my eyes, knowing that long, long though it may be, the arc of the moral universe still bends toward justice. Still bends toward justice. Thank you for traversing some distance to do this. You performed your function in a stellar fashion. And I want to thank the secretary for having you as an undersecretary. I thank the secretary. I did write her a letter. Secretary Warmuth, and I ask that this be done. I'm not saying she responded to me because I know she responded to those descendants, but I want to thank her for having you. And I also want to thank the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, for appointing her. She had the call. It was her call to make president put her in a position to make that call. This is not politics. This is just being grateful to people who've made a difference. So let's give them a hand again, please, those who've made a difference. Now, I, I cannot do this without mentioning Clyde Lemon. He's an attorney here locally. He's seated here. Clyde is a person who was persistent with the Houston NAACP under the leadership of the Bishop James Dixon. I don't see the bishop, but I, I talked to him this morning. He told me he had a heavy schedule. But uh, they teamed up, and they were over at South Texas College of Law. I was there for the ceremony that took place, and they made a hue and cry. That hue and cry 
made its way to the national NAACP, which passed a resolution. But none of this would have been done but for the descendants. The descendants, the family members who just wouldn't give in, wouldn't give up on the fight to correct an injustice. Sometimes you just wonder, how do people struggle through the years with the pain and yet take such bold steps forward to get things like this done? You have been saluted, but I don't think you'll ever be saluted enough. So I salute you and thank you for what you did with your persistence. And finally, before my statement, I want to mention at least one family member because I presented her a certificate. Ms. Holder, thank you for being so kind as to, to retain the certificate of congressional recognition presented to you. And uh, finally, the Buffalo Soldiers. Friends, this is more than brick and mortar. It, it's a great place to have an event but it really is the soul and the heart of the Buffalo Soldiers. Buffalo Soldiers, could you just please, those of you who are associated with this institution, stand up. You deserve an expression of appreciation. The Buffalo Soldiers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being in uniform. Thank you. Now, friends, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, members of the armed forces and family members, in 1917, in the midst of a world at war, our nation bore witness to a great travesty, a tragedy that has taken over a century to address. Today, as we gather to acknowledge and rectify an injustice, we must first reflect, as has been done by others before me, but reflect on the imperfections of our past. This injustice involved the convictions of 110 soldiers, the names, all of whom were recognized today by General Sullivan, after a flawed investigation and a flawed trial, this all happened after the Camp Logan riots, as they were called. Many of these men, defenders of our nation, were denied the very principles of justice that this great nation was founded upon. And they were endeavoring to protect those very principles of justice. These soldiers deserved a fair trial, a genuine investigation, and most importantly, the respect and dignity of their roles as servicemen. In their haste and prejudice, the enforcers of our justice system failed them. However, in contrast to that fact, we are here today, and the fact that we are here is a testament to the resiliency of our justice system, to the enduring spirit of truth, and to the fact that we can admit our wrongs and strive to right them. Our journey as a nation has too often been one of transgressions committed, acknowledgments made, atonement required, and enlightenment realized. We have moved from a deeply divided society governed by the inhumanity of prejudice to occasions such as today's wherein the very institution that was once the perpetrator of an injustice seeks to redress its wrongs. Yet, while we commemorate this momentous occasion, wherein we have literally 
bent the arc of the moral universe toward justice, we cannot rest on our laurels. The painful truth is that the story of the 110 black soldiers is a stark reminder of the racial prejudices that men and women of color continue to face. Whether it's in the streets, in the boardrooms, or even in the hallowed halls of justice, there is still ample empirical evidence to show that treatment and advancement in our country is much too often dependent upon the color of skin and not the content of character within. We must ensure this is our mission. We must ensure this is our goal. We must ensure this is our calling. We must ensure that the sacrifice and the suffering of the black soldiers of the 24th Infantry Regiment inspire us to fight for a more equitable, just, and inclusive America. Let us challenge ourselves to do more, to be more, and to strive more for an America where every citizen, regardless of their race, their religion, their creed, is treated with dignity, respect, and fairness. The exoneration of these soldiers is a step in the right direction. But my friends, my brothers, my sisters, our work is far from done. I am honored to represent you in the Congress of the United States of America. And I want you to know that in spite of all of these injustices, I still love my country. I love it. I love my country because of what it says in the Pledge of Allegiance, liberty and justice for all. I love it because we believe that all persons, as extolled in the Declaration of Independence, are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I love it, Councilwoman Kamen, because it affords us the opportunity to correct the injustices of the past. They may occur, but if we take it upon ourselves, we can bend the arc of the moral universe toward liberty, and justice for all. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, my dear brothers and sisters. I thank you. Thank you, Congressman Green. Our next speaker is not only a professor of American history who has dedicated her life to this initiative, but she is also the great niece of Corporal Jesse Moore, India Company, 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry Regiment. Professor Holder completed her undergraduate studies at Louisiana State University, where she received a Bachelor of Science in Social Sciences and earned her Master's of, Masters of Arts in Social Science from Southern University. She also has a Master's in Arts in History from the University of Houston. Professor Holder is the curator of the Camp Logan Mutiny in 1917 exhibit here on display at the Buffalo Soldiers Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Angela Holder.
morning, everyone. Giving honor to God, I stand before you humble, yet proud of the occasion for which we are gathered today. My strong Pentecostal great aunt Lovey expects me to greet you in this manner, and I do not want to disappoint her. It is because of her that a six-year-old child took up the cause to work on behalf of her brother, Corporal Jesse Ball Moore. I ask for your indulgence as I have two messages to deliver. One from my heavenly imagination of what Aunt Lovey would say to you today and myself. My Aunt Lovey. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lovey Ball Kimball. I am the sister of Corporal Jesse Ball Moore. I want to start out by saying thank you and God bless you to each and every one of you for what you did for my brother. Words cannot express the joy in my heart, but I will try. When our mother received the box with Jesse's coat, Bible, goodbye letter, and a dollar, it devastated her. She told him not to go back because she felt something bad would happen to him, and this box confirmed her fears. He first signed up with permission from Uncle Alec Moore, his guardian. He worked for a bit after his first service ended, and times being what they were, he wanted to go back to the Army. Well, that uniform did make him look good, and he felt important serving his country. In Baton Rouge, there were programs honoring the men who served, and we participated in these services to keep his memory alive. I kept a picture of him and named my daughter Jessie. She was born before he died, and after he died, we still had a Jessie to love. My sister Beulah Ball Turner died at age 31 and left a four-year-old daughter, Laurel, and my brother-in-law, William Henry Turner. Laurel would marry and have three children who I would care for in the place of my sister. It was one of these children, Angela, that would do the work I'm thanking you for today. Angela saw the picture of Jesse and asked me about him. I didn't know why this child asked questions about him, which stirred the hurt in my heart. But I was told never to lie to a child. I told her he was killed by the Army in Houston, Texas, but we didn't know where he was buried. I felt good at being able to talk about my brother, and glad someone young was interested in him. A few months after I told her, I passed on to be with Mother and Jesse, but always watching over Angela. Before I turn this over to her, let me say again, thank you and God bless you for all of what you have done for Jesse. I will now sit back and listen to my great niece. Thank you, Aunt Loving. It is because of you that I took up this cause of Uncle Jesse. I, too, want to express my thanks and gratitude for the monumental decision-making process it took to get here today. The work on uncle's behalf has brought me 109 new uncles, and I am proud of and love each and every one of them. First and foremost, this work has never been about me. I am grateful for God's divine intervention, opening hearts, changing minds, and placing compassionate, caring people in my life to get things done. Not only here, but for three other soldiers affected by August 23, 1917. Sergeant Vita Henry, Private Bryant Watson, and Private Wally Strong, as of August 23, 2017, now have tombstones after 100 years without them. James Hedge and Phil Krause of the VA worked with Captain Matthews and I on their behalf regarding their burials in Houston. To all who are responsible, thank you for helping a six-year-old Baton Rouge child keep her promise to her aunt to find her brother and bring peace to his soul. Before I take my seat, I would like to tell you of Uncle Joseph Ball Sr., who went to Washington, D.C. in 1963 to get information on his older brother. There was no Freedom of Information Act in place at that time. I found his older brother in, in 1987, two years after he joined the Heavenly Gathering in 1985. 
I know they are celebrating this day, as is the Ball family. Today, family, we stand a little taller, and our tears are more joyous than sad. Help me to send a hello to United States Army veteran Charles Robert Anderson. Health matters did not allow him to be here, but he is the descendant of Sergeant William Nesbitt, for whom the first trial was named. He has not forgotten, Chuck, and neither are you. Continue getting well and see you in San Antonio. He is most ably represented today by his nephew, who pulled a big surprise. Lieutenant Colonel Thompson, please stand, sir. Thank you to all who made this day possible. I am very grateful, and as I said earlier, I'm very humbled and very proud of what was done. And thank you again on behalf of my family. God bless. Thank you, Professor Holder. Our final speaker is a descendant of Private First Class Thomas Hawkins. And like Professor Holder, has dedicated time, resources, and energy into clearing his uncle's name. Jason Holt is a seasoned attorney with more than two decades of experience in local government, municipal corporations, turnaround strategy, litigation, and fiscal management. He draws his background navigating the political and economic challenges that arise throughout redevelopment processes to assist municipalities and developers in drafting and negotiating redevelopment plans and agreements, also known as plot agreements, as well as tax appeals and tax exemptions. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jason Holt. Come on, y'all. This is supposed to be a celebration. It's getting a little too heavy in here. And this flag, my right, to your left, supposed to represent liberty, justice, freedom. Those are ideas. Those are philosophies. Those are values. And today, thanks to you all, we come closer to living up to those ideas and values. Wow, good rising. Greetings to you all. I want to thank the Buffalo Soldiers Museum and particularly Captain Matthews, PJ, who believed in this project 20 plus years ago. 20 plus years ago. And very special greetings to the undersecretaries, congressmen, descendants, elected officials, officials, dignitaries, and family members, and other distinguished guests. This historic decision is the subject of our gathering, it is the culmination of decades of work by many individuals and organizations like the NAACP, the National Bar Association, and newer organizations like the Memorial Park Conservancy, but many different lawyers and veterans and service members chipping away at the stone. What a very special thanks to Drew Brenner Beck. Drew, stand up so people know who you are. Drew partnered with uh, John Heyman in the South Texas College of Law and the local NAACP, who helped to get us across the finish line. And Angela, you've been my partner in research <clears throat> and advocacy since I had hair. <laughs> and it was black then. <laughs> 
So it's been a distinct honor and privilege to blaze this trail with you. And thank you, Mr. Undersecretary, for allowing me to have a few brief remarks, I promise. I could probably talk for about six hours, but it'll only be an hour and a half, you know. <laughs> We're standing at the crossroads of our history, the convergence of the old and the new. We are standing here because our nation has evolved, and given the nature of this gathering, I thought it best that I begin by expressing my gratitude to you all for approaching this matter with open hearts and clear minds. Today is a day that I believe would happen. I did. I honestly did. But I never thought it would happen in my lifetime. I thought I was going to have to pass it off to my son or my daughter or either one of them or any of them or somebody in the family, my other son, my other daughter. But as a descendant, I trust in the legacy of my uncle, which in his brief time on this earth is one that I am so proud of. You know, legacy is the sum total of your actions during the course of your life. And your life is a sacred journey. It is the privilege that we all have to be alive, have experience, experiences, and walk the face of this earth as human beings. And when weighed on the scale, we all pray that the scale is balanced on the side of virtue, buttressed by the courage to have made the decisions that cut to the core of our fundamental DNA as human beings. Today, I see that courage. I see that courage in the families, in the service, our elected representatives, and in the undersecretaries in our government, reflecting the values and ideas that are subsumed within those flags. It's not easy to walk it. Hey, anybody could talk it, though. It's not easy to walk it. Whether you agree or disagree with what happened in that courtroom, on this day, there is a recognition that justice did not prevail. An immortal wound that was inflicted on due process in military jurisprudence could only be healed by the setting aside of the convictions of these soldiers. Indeed, Congressman, as you spoke of the moral compass, the moral compass that beats in the heart of this nation could not allow these convictions to stand any longer. I mean, the wheels of justice grind slow. It's only 100 years, but it happened. Today, the legacy of these soldiers, their patriotism and service to our nation, protecting freedoms that they themselves could not enjoy, is being respected and uplifted. I pray with all my heart that their souls witness these moments of reckoning, and are set free. Let it be said to the Buffalo Soldiers by all who are gathered here in this space in the spirit of love, decency, and atonement that your souls are welcome here. Please, say it with me. Your souls are welcome here. Your souls are welcome here. We stand on your shoulders, on your sacrifice, on your suffering, on your commitment to love of this country, on your wearing of the cloth, the very fabric, the cloth of this nation. We need to acknowledge that, and today, Undersecretary, you have done just that. So I want to personally thank you for that. Since in many respects, we are here to celebrate and acknowledge the spirit of the men of the 24th, I would be remiss if I didn't repeat something that already happened. Traditionally for me, I like to call the names of the first 13 men that were executed. Now in a discussion the other evening with Angela, 
she actually helped remind me that there was an order to who stood on the gallows. So there was an order for the first 13 men. They were sentenced to be hung by the neck until dead. And I told that to somebody, and we were having a discussion. And they said, what? I said, yes. The sentence said, sentenced to be hung by the neck until dead. That's not a reflection of what we were talking about. That's not our better angels. So they were executed without a fair trial, review or appeal. So if you will indulge me, I would like to call their names. Is that okay? All right. Corporal, I'm going to call their names in the order in which they stood on the hanging scaffold. Corporal Charles Baltimore, one. Private Ira B. Davis, two. PFC William Breckenridge, three. Corporal John, Corporal Larnon J. Brown, four. Private James Divins, five. PFC Carlos Snodgrass, six. Corporal Jesse Moore, seven. Corporal James Wheatley, eight. Private Pat, Pat McWhorter, nine. Sergeant William C. Nesbitt, ten. My uncle, PFC Thomas Coleman, Hawk, Coleman Hawkins, eleven. Private Risley W. Young, 12. Private Frank Johnson, 13. From the families of those executed to all of you, nothing, nothing can replace what we lost. The worth of their lives is not found on a sheet of paper. Every human being has value. And forgetting that is the most grievous wrong. Taking their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, and so on cannot be replaced. That is lost forever in the ultimate abyss of what if. But today is in truth a day of, of atonement. Congressman, you mentioned that. A day of atonement for the Jim Crow era South and legalized segregation. Today, a mortal blow has been dealt to the injustice of the master-slave relationship, such that 106 years later, the color of their skin was not a barrier to the fair dispensation of military jurisprudence. And we all here rejoice that their convictions were overturned and set aside. And having been a person who's done discharge upgrades, being given a coveted honorable discharge is particularly thrilling. What would T.C. Hawkins' mother and father say today? I think they will quote from his last letter and the undersecretary did the family in honor of actually quoting from it. The letter that he wrote just before he was hung, I think they would say, tell them that our boy died, a strong Christian, a soldier with faith, and as he stepped onto the hanging scaffold with 12 other soldiers, before their necks were snapped, he mocked death. Just as his trial mocked justice, he unequivocally, unequivocally declared in his letter, I fear not death. Did not Jesus ask, death, where art thy sting? He continued, I am not guilty of the crime that I am accused of. But mother, it is God's will that I go now and in this way. He made it clear that his faith could not be shaken, that you can take the body, 
but the spirit, the very essence of his life, shall continue on. The spirit, the spirit shall rise, just as truth crushed to earth shall rise again and again and again until the injustice that struck down the body is addressed. They would say that our boy was executed for crimes he did not commit, but he died with forgiveness in his heart. Who can replace the loss of a son to a mother? They would say, where do we go to get our boy back? Ironically, for Thomas Coleman Hawkins, he penned a letter in February of 1916 to his father, trying to calm his dad's concern that he would never see him again in this life. That was 1916. Little did he know the fate that awaited him. And that these concerns would prove to be true. Consequently, again, we are here 106 years later discussing the events of that fateful night in August and the resulting trial that scorned, scorned justice. So I ask, what would C.C. Hawkins say? He would say, I lived in a time where a colored soldier, a veteran who fought for this country, had to go thirsty because the water barrel was marked for whites only. I lived in a time when indiscriminate abuse by the police was condoned, when our tools of self-defense were being stripped away. But we had pride. We had dignity. We wore the uniform and earned our respect. We stood tall because we were soldiers of the 24th Infantry, colored troopers, buffalo soldiers. Our legacy was robust, stout, and durable. We had families who believed in us and believed in our medal right here in Houston. And thus comes the question that life asks each one of us, where do you stand when your faith is tested? What price are you willing to pay to hold on to your honor and to stick to your principles? Are you willing to pay the ultimate price? He answered that question with intestinal fortitude and grit in the final moment of truth. His legacy was cemented. If you fear not death, what is it that you cannot accomplish in life? Today, he would say that my faith has been rewarded, my family and our collective legacy is heightened, my ledger has been cleared. This was only a snapshot in time of what our ancestors had to experience just 42 years after the adoption of the 13th Amendment. A snapshot that stands in stark contrast to our better angels and to whom we aspire to be. I am sure that 106 years ago, the men of the 24th never dreamed about being in a room like this with such enthusiastic supporters of a clemency petition, nor would they have thought that even posthumously their convictions would be set aside. In fact, for the colored soldiers to be in an integrated room, eating, drinking, and socializing would have been unthinkable. But time has a way of instituting changes. We may not always realize the far-reaching impact that our individual struggles will have on our fellow humankind, but be assured that this snapshot in time has done more to acknowledge and preserve our history than we can fathom at this moment. It seems like it's just the right time. I'm privileged to enjoy 
a lot of the privileges that this country has to offer. I'm a practicing lawyer with a great firm, CSG Law, and as I stand here and look out, it's not due to my own sacrifice. It's due to the sacrifice of those who came before me, of those who were willing to pay the ultimate price. Faces, names, people too numerous to mention, organizations, men with courage who said, hey, it's not right. 106 years is too long. So it's been my privilege and honor to have represented my family throughout these many years, those that are here and those that have passed on, and to speak on behalf of those whose voices were silenced. The poetic justice of this moment in this building. PJ, this ain't your garage, man. And it's not that little house over there anymore. The poetic justice of this moment is not lost on any of us who have been walking this trail for so long. Today, the men of the 24th are not forgotten. They are remembered. Today, one more giant step towards righteousness has been realized. And there is no question that their souls are welcome here. So say it with me one more time. Your souls are welcome here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Holt. On February 22nd, 2022, the Army and the Department of Veterans Affairs held a ceremony at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, to unveil an interpretive marker commemorating the soldiers of the 3rd of the 24th. I am thrilled that we will reveal an addition that will be made to that marker. If I can direct your attention to the screen, you will see the updated digital rendering of the changes that will be made to that plaque in three, two, one. The update reads, the Army reviewed the cases in 2023 and determined the widespread racism and the tensions that triggered the 1917 Houston riot pervaded the trial process for these soldiers making their trials unfair. The Secretary of the Army set aside all convictions and directed the soldiers' records reflect honorable discharges. A ceremony honoring their legacy was held on November 13, 2023 at the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum in Houston, Texas. Thank you to our friends at the Department of Veterans Affairs for this gorgeous rendering and addendum, which will honor the 3rd of the 24th permanently at Fort Sam Houston. Please give a final round of applause for their dedication and tireless efforts. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing by First Sergeant Lewis and Staff Sergeant Winslow. The words will be found in your program. And then remain standing for the benediction by Chaplain Monica Lawson.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Please join us after the ceremony for a reception in the rear of this room. If you would like a tour of the museum, it is open to our audience until 2 p.m. for self-guided tours. If you have any questions, please find an escort. Thank you again for attending this wonderful ceremony. Please enjoy the rest of your day. the church say amen that's probably the quickest <laughs> amen let us pray most merciful God as we prepare to leave from this place help us to share the stories of those whose lives and legacies we remember we ask oh God that the healing of hurt that has lingered for decades begin to manifest itself in a very real way may we intentionally seek to live by the words of what you oh God require of us to act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. We also ask, dear God, for your blessing upon the food that has been prepared for the reception. May it be a nourishment to our bodies and the fellowship a nourishment to our souls, for our souls are welcome here. May your grace and your mercy follow us. May your light shine within us, and may your love and peace cover us as we depart from this place, but never your presence. This we ask in your most holy and precious name. Amen. You may now leave. Amen. Amen. <laughs>